Hey everybody, I hope you're all doing well. Today, we'll be learning about the Create a Configuration File objective for the RHCE. It's similarly also mentioned up here as just configuration files, by the way. But what these objectives are almost certainly referring to is the ansible.cfg file, which is where you would set various options and defaults for Ansible. You can do a whole lot with this file, but in this video, I just want to narrow it down to the more common stuff that I would focus on in my study for this exam. So with all of that being said, let's jump right into this. We can get started by checking out the system-wide Ansible configuration file. So that's located in slash etc Ansible, and it's called ansible.cfg. Here it is. And these days, this file is going to be pretty boring, as you can see. It's just telling us to run something called ansible-config init to generate the actual file that we're looking for. So let's do that. We have two commands here that we can run. There's this one, and then there's this second one. But we'll go with the second one since it claims to provide us with a more complete file. Although, out of the box, both of these commands are likely to do exactly the same thing since we didn't get any additional plugins. So yeah, I'll quit out of here, and I'm gonna make a directory called project1 for this video, and I'll cd into there, and then I'll just paste that command. Here it is, and I'm gonna rename this output file to ansible-template.cfg, since uh, we're gonna be using this sort of like a template for our purposes, and there we go. So I'll open this up, and uh, yeah. Let me first just say right off the bat that this file is ginormous, but don't be overwhelmed. There are just a couple of things in here that I'd like to highlight for our purposes, and that'll be the defaults and privilege escalation sections. So first things first, let's talk about defaults. You'll notice here that this is the biggest section of the file, if you keep track of the line numbers, but there are just a couple of options to be aware of that I found to be quite useful. So I'll search these ones out real quick. Uh, first, we'll start with the inventory key right here. And so this is how you would tell Ansible where your inventory file is at. This is definitely extremely handy. We'll be using this all the time in our ansible.cfg files. So I think it's really important to remember. And next, there is the remote underscore user key right here. So this is how you would tell Ansible what user to try and initially log in as over SSH or whatever connection protocol you happen to be using. So this is also going to be super useful as well. Next, I'd like to tell you about the ask underscore pass key. This is disabled by default, but it can be useful if you don't have key-based authentication set up with SSH and you need to manually enter in your login password for the managed nodes. So yeah, we'll be using that one quite a bit in the beginning until we get key-based authentication set up. In a similar stride, there's also the connection uh, password file uh, option. So this isn't actually super important. In fact, I'd say that this is a terrible idea if you don't implement it securely, but I thought I'd at least show you uh, what it is, or at least mention it, because this is one way that you could automate entering in your SSH password for the managed nodes. I'm not saying that we should use it, though. In the future, like I was saying, uh, we'll set up a public key authentication scheme, so we won't need to manually enter in the password every time. But that'll just be until we get acquainted with playbooks and stuff so that we can deploy the keys at scale properly. That's just a bit of foreshadowing for you. Anyways, next I'd like to tell you about the host underscore key underscore checking key. And so this controls whether you want SSH to vet that the connection to the server isn't potentially compromised by an on-path or man-in-the-middle attack. The effect of setting this to false is that the host key will automatically get accepted when you log on. And that might be useful, it'll surely save us a couple of extra steps when we're connecting to our managed nodes for the first time, but in a similar way to what I was talking about before, this is not exactly secure in a production setting. Uh, okay, 
So the last key in the default section that I'd like to bring up is forks. So this is a basic way to control the parallelism that Ansible employs when managing a lot of hosts. By default, it'll work in chunks of five, but you can change that to something else depending on your needs. Okay. So the next major section that I'd like to show you is privilege escalation. Uh, so here's where it begins. And I'd like to start with the become key. So let's see if I can find that. It says become a lot, but I'm talking about this one. And yeah, uh, you can toggle this key to true or false if you want your playbook to escalate privileges right away after login. And it'll always do that, by the way, whether or not it actually needs those privileges to do its work. So just keep that in mind. There is a similar instruction you can use to dictate this kind of thing in a play, by the way. Uh, I'll show you that in a future video. But next, um, I'd like to show you the become underscore ask pass key. And as the name suggests, this uh, enables prompting for your password so that Ansible can run the privilege escalation command, which is sudo by default. And speaking of which, uh, there is the become underscore method key. Um, and this is the type of program that you can set for escalating privileges. And usually, like I said, this is going to be sudo. But there are indeed alternatives to sudo, like pkexec, doas, and the classic su command. So that's always nice. But yeah, um, we're, we're just going to stick with sudo for these videos. And finally, I'd like to show you the become underscore user option. So this is, of course, uh, how you would name what user you would like to escalate to by default. This is almost always going to be the root user, but of course you can change it to something else if you want. Okay, so that'll be all uh, for this file. I'll just quit out of here and I'll clear the screen. And I guess um, now let's go ahead and start planning some stuff out for using our own file. And I guess one thing to think about is whether we even want to use the system-wide ansible.cfg file in the first place. So you'll see here if I run ansible dash dash version that the uh, file in etc is taking top priority right now. So in my opinion, when using this file, it might seem convenient at first, but in reality, it's not super flexible because you need root privileges to work with it. And usually we would want to try and get as much done as possible without using root, right? So yeah, let's move on to the next option. And so that would be to make a configuration file for our local user account by adding a dot file to the home directory, just like this. And we would call it dot ansible dot cfg, just like that. And I mean, this is a little bit better. Obviously, we won't need to use root to edit this file, so that's always good. And um, I mean, it's nice to be aware of this one. Of course, you can tell that it's working now if I run ansible dash dash version. Uh, the config file is set to the one in my home directory now. Pretty cool. Uh, but we might not want to solely rely on this file for every project. So we'll move right along to something else. And by far, this is the most flexible option. And that is to create a new ansible.cfg file for every project directory that we work on. So I'm in project one's directory right now, and I can go ahead and touch an ansible.cfg file for this project, just like so. And if I run the command again, you'll see here that it's pointing to the one in my current directory now. Cool. So yeah, this method has the benefit of centralizing the configuration for our project in one place instead of having it scattered around, which I really like a lot. And uh, while I'm at it, let me tell you about some things to be aware of. Um, so yeah, when I was showing you the ansible dash dash version command, you probably were able to tell that ansible prioritizes the .cfg files in a certain order, with the one in the current directory being the highest priority, and then next would be the one in your home directory, and last would be the one in etc. And um, so just another thing to take note, when Ansible does choose a configuration file to use, it only picks one. It doesn't mix in the settings from the lower priority ones, it only takes what's in a single file and nothing else. 
Um, the other thing that I want you to keep in mind is that world writable directories are a big no-no for Ansible.cfgs. That's the security posture you get with Ansible. They don't want anyone to be able to tamper with your Ansible.cfg file because it's a security risk. So we can check right now that I'm in a good position by doing this. Actually, I need ls-ld. There we go. So my directory isn't world writable, so uh, we can tell that it's going to work. But make sure to keep that in mind and check um, if you're having trouble with Ansible getting to recognize your file. Okay, so I know that was a ton of information, but now we have the easy part left, which is just applying what we know now to write our own Ansible.cfg. I'll just go ahead and open up the Ansible.cfg file I just touched, and I can start with some square brackets and uh, create the defaults section. And as I was saying earlier, one of the first things you're going to want to do in defaults is specify your inventory. So I'll just type in inventory equals, and then I'll set it to something like dot slash inventory dot ini. I don't think I actually have a file like that in this project directory, so I'll need to create one later on. But yeah, anyways, I like to throw in the remote underscore user uh, option, and I'm going to set this to admin because I know I have the admin account set up on all my managed nodes, so I'd like to use that. And another thing that I like to do is set ask underscore pass to true. So this is false by default, that's why we're overriding it, but I'm making it true because I don't have public key authentication set up with my managed nodes yet. So I'm going to need to enter in the password manually, and if you have it false, it'll just throw an error back at you, uh, unless you, uh, you know, set up PKI. Okay, uh, next uh, I'm going to set host underscore key underscore checking to false. Um, and the reason why I'm doing this is because I haven't logged into these managed nodes properly yet. So the fingerprint or host key fingerprint, whatever you want to call it, has not been saved to my known host file. So it's going to complain at me unless I disable that right now. But we'll take care of all of this later on when we set up uh, PKI later, like I was just saying. Uh, another thing that I'd like to do is just set forks equal to something else like two. Uh, then we can see that it'll work in chunks of two at a time. Why not? And then moving on to the privilege escalation section, I always have to make sure I spell this right. Privilege underscore escalation. There we go. Sometimes I forget the underscore. Sometimes I spell privilege wrong and so on and so forth. Uh, I would just double check that if you have difficulty with that as well. Anyways, I'm going to set become equal to true. And so that means that immediately after logging in, it's going to try to escalate to a higher, higher user. And that will be the become underscore user, which I'll set to root. So it's going to try and escalate to the root user right away. Uh, anyways, uh, next I can set become underscore ask underscore pass to true. And what this will do is ask for the pseudo password, uh, which will be useful in this current configuration because I don't have the no password option set up in pseudo yet for my managed nodes. Uh, otherwise, we're going to get errors if I don't do that. And lastly, uh, we can just go ahead and do this for fun. I'm just going to set become underscore method to pseudo. This is the default, so we didn't actually need to specify this in the file, but it is something that we just went over earlier, so why not name it, right? Anyways, so I can just save this file now. Cool. And to show you that it's actually working, I'm going to have to overlap a little bit of this content with the content of the next RHCE video, which is going to be about ad hoc commands. But this is the only way I'd be able to show you how to test this out properly. So here's a teaser for the next video, I guess. Let's write a quick and dirty inventory file like this. I'll just call it inventory.ini, like I named in the CFG file. And I'll just put in app server onelabnet um, uses port 2222, because that was one of the quirks with that machine. And then app server 2 through 5 um dot labnet are normal and we'll just put them in the ungrouped group i guess that was a nice short review of what we did last time and now i can quickly demo this by running ansible 
and then giving a host or group. So I can give app server one dot labnet, for example. And that's something named in my inventory file, so it's okay. And then I'll give a module with a dash M and the module I'll use is ping. So if I run this, it's going to ask for the SSH password. So that's a good sign. I'll just type that in. It's also going to ask for the become password. So that's good. Uh, we, that's what we told it to do. And by running that, you'll see that uh, it worked out pretty well. Um, so that basically that ping command ran a Python script on the remote host. That's basically what happened. And yeah, uh, we can also do something else that requires elevated privileges this time. So we're actually using that capability by running Ansible and then we'll give the ungrouped group and then dash M for a module and I'll give the command module and then I can give options with dash A for this command um, and I'll just make it touch slash test file. So obviously we're going to need root privileges to write in the uh, slash directory. So if I just run this, it's going to ask for the SSH password again. That's all good. It's also going to ask for the become password. I can just hit enter. And now it ran that on all of the hosts. And you might have noticed um, how quickly it was going. It was doing it in two forks at a time, basically, that option that we set earlier. Cool. So uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, it just created that test file on all of the hosts. We can even check that um, by just doing an ls of the test file, right? I'll just make it ls-l, and then I'll just do this again. And there we go. There is the listing of that file, and it is indeed available on all of our hosts. Pretty cool. Yeah. So I'm going to keep my lips tight about the rest of this wizardry with ad hoc commands so that I have something to show for the next video. This video is getting pretty long anyways, so there was a little taste of what's coming up in the next RHCE video. And with that being said, I hope the information I presented here helped you out. I try to make it as accurate as I can with the understanding I currently possess, but you can let me know if I made any error at any time in the comments. That'll surely help others who watch the video stay well informed. And yeah, that about wraps it up. So as always, thanks for watching.